Hello, yes, welcome back to my second painting video uh, of Scar the Pirate Queen, the bust from Privateer Press. This video will be focusing on the non-metallic metal components uh, and whatever else I work on. So, um, as I said uh, in my first video, that the way that I approach painting is a very iterative process so you'll see I tend to bounce around a fair bit uh, from section to section so uh, let's get into the uh, methodology here around non-metallic metal so I'm um, using a color called uh, golden olive which is a Vallejo model color uh, and the uh, the first thing that you need to consider when painting non-metallic metal is the uh, the placement of the light, uh, where the light's coming from, uh, and that will inform then you know the decisions about where you position the highlights and the shadows. So it's it's actually generally the first thing you should think about when you're painting a model um, at all, but uh, more important uh, for non-metallic metal and how that works. So I'm uh, uh, have a light source from the top left of the model and you can sort of see if you have a look at the boobies that is um, evident in the way that I've highlighted those two shapes and so the placement of the lights on the metal is mostly focused on uh, where the light would bounce if it's coming from that same top left location. Um, but light uh, on metal does have a tendency to uh, to do a bit of bouncing around and so you, you get these little uh, bounce lights which can uh, can be either reflecting uh, the surfaces around uh, the model uh, or, or, the, or the object or you can also have light just bouncing around that's why you can see there on those little panels I'm sort of doing two sections of highlighting um, to try and replicate that that bounce effect um, uh, this is a, a bit of gold and olive mixed in with uh, ice yellow and, uh, and as always a bit of the uh, magic mix from Joe Sonia just to help the paint flow a little bit smoother um, and again uh, not really focusing on precision at this point uh, it's more focused on um, getting uh, the lights in the, the correct spot um, I'll make changes as, as it goes along and uh, little tweaks, um, adding more lights or uh, in some cases shadows um, and uh, importantly uh, hitting the edges. It's a consistent uh, effect of uh, metallic surfaces is the edges tend to reflect uh, light very sharply. So uh, you'll see as it progresses that I focus uh, on making sure that each of the edges is uh, is highlighted both from uh, the top which is uh, where the, the normal light would be hitting but also from underneath where you have that those reflective lights from the ground uh, like this um, so just just sort of a, a note on the term saturation or desaturation it's it's a basically a term that um, describes how much grey a colour has in it. So a desaturated colour has a, a lot of grey, uh, very greyed out, um, whereas a saturated colour is a very pure, uh, intense colour. Uh, and so with non-metallic metals, um, I tend to start with a desaturated colour, a very greyish colour, um, for, for a couple of reasons. It'll, it'll contrast with the more saturated colours that that bounce around on the model and the skin tones and uh, other areas uh, but also it gives you uh, more contrast uh, within the individual volume so for example um, uh, with metals uh, if we go back to the uh, the concept of the value scale that I talked about in the first video um, where, where white is a 10 and, uh, and black is a 0 uh, you know, for most sections, like for example, in the skin tone here, you know, it probably starts as its darkest point is about a, you know, a five or a six, and it goes all the way up to a nine uh, in terms of the value range that the skin works in. Um, 
the non-metallic metal uh, to sell the effect you need to use um, pretty much uh, the full value scale you need to go from the brightest lights of, of a 10 all the way down to the darkest shadows down to zero uh, to help sell the uh, effect so uh, this is uh, just just ice yellow again you can see I'm, I'm refining where the lights are based on that uh, that idea of the light coming from the top left and also causing lights uh, to bounce around you know sometimes light will reflect off one metallic surface and, and uh, contact uh, one near it so that sort of makes some of the decisions you know mostly uh, there is no real uh, hard and fast rules it's just uh, about seeing what looks cool following the rule of cool um, so this is pure uh, ivory Vallejo model color ivory and uh, I'm being again not not very precise with uh, this but positioning it uh, in the really uh, high points where I want to have the highest lights uh, and again I'm going with that same uh, methodology as I did on the skin which is that we're going to over contrast and then we're going to use glazes to both smooth out the layers that we've previously done but also just to uh, refine and uh, and subtly add some other colors uh, but this particular um, figure I'm going to use contrast paints to, to do that um, process so um, so that's I mean you can already sort of see the metal um, taking shape and, and, and sort of having somewhat of the appearance of, of metal but um, to you know to to continue to work in and, and around uh, the stuff that you've already done is is probably the most enjoyable part of um, uh, the way that I approach painting once you reach this point you know you get to add little little nuances and color variations and uh, work on smoothing each of the various sections so it's um it's quite a fun process. Uh, so here you'll see uh, the magnificent camera work. It's a lovely close-up shot of the top of uh, that model's head. Uh, really great stuff there from Big Deno. Um, as I go and grab some other colors, um, I did edit it out. You can see there uh, some contrast paints magically appearing. Uh, so this is uh, a mixture of uh, the contrast colors, uh, snake bite leather, and some green color I can never remember. Um, and I've diluted that fairly heavily, and uh, and also used a bit of the magic mix as well. And we're doing a this uh, like a filter across the surface, like a full, uh, pretty much covering all of it. Um, one of the you know one of the advantages of the contrast paints is is uh, they've got a you know, a bit of flexibility about how you can use them. Uh, the the application there was was as a filter, so it's basically covered the whole surface. But if you have a look at, at each of those transition areas now, as I use the hair dryer to to dry that off, um, they've already begun to uh, soften and, and come together a little bit smoother, uh, as well as adding the the atmospheric green colours and um, create a little bit more visual interest so that's not the end we will uh, we will keep working with the metal and uh, continue to refine the blends and work through it and stuff um, you can also use contrast colors in a very targeted approach um, and just in specific areas which I will show later on uh, here I've gone back to despair green and uh, using it uh, quite diluted to just uh, add some uh, reflections and, and uh, darker colors so that the you know, scar is a in the in the background of uh, war machines is a pirate pirate queen and so she um, I envisage her to be standing on on a boat and uh, having the the water sort of reflecting subtly underneath so there'll be some some bluey green tones added into the uh, 
to the lower portion of her um, chest and, uh, and other areas as well, just to uh, further reinforce that illusion of, um, of where she is. So um, this whole section has been at uh, normal speed, by the way, so you've been able to see the, uh, the process as it happens. Uh, so I've gone back with the uh, with the toxic waste green and ice yellow mix, and uh, added a little bit of the uh, Joe Sonia magic mix. And you can see that it, uh, from looking at the tip of the brush that it's much more dilute, and I've got much less paint on my brush than previously. And uh, I'm just being very uh, precise in how I uh, use this over those uh, light areas. To, uh, to just smooth the transitions and, and bring back some of those high contrast areas that we lost with the contrast layer. So as I said before, the, the key um, in selling a, a convincing uh, metal effect is, uh, is that, that value uh, shift from light to dark. And so this um, uh, next part is actually where I'm going to uh, black line and uh, separate each section as well as um, uh, take some, some very, very deep shadows and then I'll go back in and continue to refine the lights. This is just more, more glazes, more smoothing of the, uh, the uh, previously completed highlights. So yes, this, this is black lining, so it's a little bit of Despair Green mixed with uh, the Chimera Black. Uh, Chimera Black, really nice black color, um, probably the best black on the market, I think. Very, very uh, matte, very thin, allows you to uh, do black lining like this very, very easily. So it's a worthwhile color to pick up. Uh, the whole set's quite good, actually. Um, but by using the black lining here to really clearly delineate each section, you you again further reinforce that uh, metal feeling um, and, uh, and it helps add the darkest uh, values that it needs to look there's a little, little glaze of the black as well just to separate that section from the others and uh, you can see from there that it's that the uh, the contrast and then the second layer of glazing with the brush has pretty much smoothed off and refined all of those previous um, scratchy highlights. Uh, you could continue to work more and more uh, in working through to to smooth and sort out those sorts of details, but uh, that's that's the uh, the decision you have to make. You know, sometimes a little bit of that texture and stuff creates a bit more visual interest uh, particularly when put aside uh, you know the skin tone which is very uh, smooth uh, so this is ivory and ice yellow mixed together um, really focusing here on the very uh, edges and uh, and where the light would be reflecting most uh, heavily so and uh, and often non-metallic metal tends to look pretty shit house uh, right up until this last stage you know it won't sort of look much like a metallic surface until you reach this very end step and when you put that final uh, sort of white light on it it uh, it suddenly comes alive and starts to look uh, a little bit more like what you were hoping it would look like some magnificent shithouse camera work again at least you can see a little bit of it. That's good. Better than it was. So this is a, you know, I guess a, a comparison with the the airbrushing technique. You can use the airbrush to to smooth out the uh, the metals in the same way as I use the contrast color or you know just a normal color. It's it's all all 
uh, valid techniques and there's there's various reasons to use you know the airbrush versus the the brush versus a contrast versus a normal paint um, and that's just uh, something to experiment with um, the reason for the airbrush on skin tone is uh, as a female I wanted her to have a soft smooth skin and uh, the contrast and uh, normal brush highlights on the armor I wanted it to have a bit more texture and a bit more uh, visual interest so uh, we're back at times two speed now uh, just uh, working through the other sections of um, of uh, non-metallic metal and uh, I'll allow that uh, to progress without uh, talking too much over this section uh, we do have a few other bits that we'll work on as well so Uh, so I'm just going back in uh, and working on the hair. I think I said in the first video, the uh, the best way in my experience to do a black uh, is to over contrast and then use some glaze layers uh, to bring the black back into the color. Uh, here I'm doing uh, despair green mixed in with a little black um, just to uh, darken the hair up. Um, you know, I think the the most important thing with uh, this this hair and, and uh, the model in general is just being very cognizant of the the atmospheric surroundings of uh, of the model. Um, you know, the hair is supposed to look black, but it's in an environment with green light, and so it should be reflecting light that is somewhat green. All right, here we go on the uh, the leather. Um, so this is another use for uh, contrast paints and. Uh, the uh, color I've used here is that ice yellow again, just mixed in with the Arbuckles Brown. Uh, and as you can see, I'm being extremely precise, uh, just adding lots of lots of textural dots and scratches and lines and uh, marks, and just focus really on uh, on the volumes and where the light would go. But but again, just working with uh, some interesting textures and shapes. Um, the the reason for uh, that is, I want to use the contrast paints for a second, uh, the second way I use them, which is uh, uh, to create a, a base to work from. So, you know, this is this is more uh, pure contrast with very little dilution uh, versus the the glaze that I used on the uh, on the breastplate. Um, and what what I find uh, with this sort of uh, surface with leather, um, it's very interesting, very easy to um, uh, do interesting textural elements but uh, the problem with the way that humans paint and this is just using the uh, hair dryer here to smooth that off uh, we, we have a tendency to want to be very organized and very um, you know if you're doing freckles on a face you, you'll you'll try to do freckles evenly and it's a very hard habit to break it's very hard to look uh, natural so by using the the contrast paint uh, in that area, uh, it tends to dry pretty irregularly, uh, which creates some natural variation uh, as as a surface to work from for the uh, for the cloak. So that's uh, that's the reasoning behind um, using the contrast paint there and and uh, creating a, a interesting base to work from. Uh, so as I do this little neck bracer thing. Um, it's, it's a good example of the, the rule of cool and, uh, and also some uh, thought processes around um, why I've done uh, this. The, the lighting, as I've said, uh, is coming from the top left of the model. And yet on this uh, neck plate, I'm doing the lights on the right hand side. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is uh, just the model, her, her big old melon. I think would block uh, a lot of the light coming through and hitting that left hand side um, and so by putting uh, the light on the right 
feels slightly more accurate to how it would actually react. And uh, secondly, it's also just a little bit more visible from the, the optimal viewing angle, which is from the front. And so again, because it looks a bit cooler, I think that's the right approach to go for the cooler option. Uh, so once again, using the hairdryer, uh, this is again, a similar process, same colors, uh, same techniques as on the chest plate. So that's why we're running it to a sped up speed. We're just using the same uh, techniques, same concept. So um, it's just a, a different volume. So probably the, um, you know, the, the most interesting thing about uh, non-metallic metal is just working out how light is going to interact with each of the different volumes and so you know there we've got a little oval shape which is relatively easy we've got a cylinder on the chest and then we've got you know a, a relatively flat surface uh, there on the on that bottom uh, lip uh, so that's sort of a, a pretty easy uh, thing to work out um, and you can you can use that same methodology for uh, breaking down uh, any surface you know skin tones are very spherical so that should determine where your, your highlights go on on skin tones and vice versa uh, I did just do a quick glaze there of some despair green uh, just on the lower portions again uh, reinforcing that uh, watery element underneath um, did the black lining to separate that uh, that lip from the chest plate and here I'm just doing little glazes, thin glazes to uh, harmonize and smooth the uh, the various blends. Uh, so if, if uh, you know, I've, I've done uh, more uh, reflective uh, mirror-like uh, metals, you know, that's, that's a good time to use the airbrush for that sort of surface. Uh, for me, this is a bit more of a you know, rough and ready sort of surface, so I like the, the little bit of texture coming through. Uh, so what I'm doing right at this moment is uh, loading up my airbrush with some AK Interactive Ultra Matte. So this is a varnish, it's a matte varnish. And I actually do this several times throughout the painting of a model. Uh, I painted the scar for about two hours in total, and I did two layers of varnish throughout that time. Uh, and the reason for that is you have varying um, uh, elements that uh, have vary, varying colors, sorry, that have different layers of reflectiveness. Contrast paints are a good example. They can be very, very uh, satin reflective, um, whereas you know some scale 75 colors or other colors can be quite matte. And so you can get some uh, a concept uh, 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 your eyes can be tricked about how impressive your highlighting is and how smooth your transitions are when you uh, look at a more satin finish. And so I find that uh, using the varnish allows you to get a much better, um, much clearer understanding of how smooth uh, your transitions are in actuality um, by removing any uh, actual effects of the light. So the matte varnish is very much a truer representation of the actual painting work you've done. It also seals the work you've done to a little bit, which is which is nice. So um, yeah, pretty pretty important part of the process when you use a variety of different paint ranges with a variety of different finishes as I like to do. Uh, so as I was talking before about the sort of the shape of objects and how that's quite interesting um, to to work through for non-metallic metal. These shoulder pads are a great example of when it can be very difficult to come up with the right um, light effects. Um, I don't actually think I, I did a fantastic job on, on understanding how the light would interact with these objects, but um, the, uh, the important thing is just, is just to keep experimenting and practicing with it um, you know sometimes you you find it easy like there's little elements of this you know this the little oval spheres they're they're easy little edges they're pretty easy but you know this is this is uh, also a relatively flat surface for the majority of the breastplate which is a uh, a challenging surface to try and uh, highlight correctly for a non-metallic metal 
Uh, again, yeah, sim similar colors to what was used before, uh, similar techniques to what was already shown on that chest plate. Uh, just very uh, imprecise, uh, trying to get the actual light placements correct, uh, focusing more on the uh, positioning uh, and using the correct colors than precision of blends. And this is the, yeah, the reason why I'm able to paint models as quickly as I do is, is this is um, the process. You, you, you sketch, you, you look at, at what the model is going to look like. And, um, you know, if you squint a little bit at, at a, you know, that sort of shoulder plate, you can actually sort of see what it's going to look like uh, after you've done all of the transition smoothing. So you sketch out what you want and then uh, work to refine it. Very quick, very easy. Um, and very fun. Oh, There's more, more repetition here, so I'll go dark for a little bit. Um, so it's interesting uh, if you if you were to take uh, this model and have a look at the uh, the face uh, now and compare it to the face uh, prior to the uh, chest plate and the shoulder pads being done, um, you'll see that the face looks different, uh, even though it's not different, because of how uh, your eyes are tricked by the other. Um, surfaces around it you know the best example of this is most people will uh, remember painting a, a model and dry brushing a base you know that that tends to look very uh, uneven and unfinished until you do the edges around the base in black and all of a sudden it it, uh, it looks finished it looks alive and that's because your eyes aren't being tricked by what's uh, around the base you're only seeing the elements that you want to see and uh, you know that that's how uh, painting works in general. Uh, if you if you are looking at a piece and looking at a skin tone and all of the colors around it are a light skin tone, that, a light color like the gray undercoat, the skin tone is going to look darker by virtue of that. So, um, all right, so we're, we're going to go in and do some, uh, some more work on the cloak here. So um, I've actually gone with a different highlight color here uh, using uh, Orchid Light, a Nocturna color which is actually a pale desaturated purple. Uh, two reasons I've used purple. One, um, again, just calling back to the original artwork colors of purple and green, uh, which is uh, just a little subtle hint at that. Um, but second, it's important to not uh, overload the model with that information about uh, atmosphere. I mean, it's uh, there is certainly still a little bit of toxic waste green and a little bit of... Um, ice yellow in this mix which uh, th there'll be other varying sections added but um, it's just creating a little bit more again visual interest a little bit more contrast to uh, give you some something different to look at uh, the second um, uh, thing you'll notice here is I'm being very uh, you know a lot of stippling motions a lot of sort of uh, thin lines um, and that's a uh, uh, conscious choice to contrast with the uh, smooth skin tone that it sits beside it. So contrast isn't just the value contrast of light and dark or um, saturated, desaturated, as I said, it's it uh, can also be textured and smooth. So uh, you're creating visual interest and uh, that's the important part.
Contrast is defined in the dictionary as the juxtaposition of strikingly different elements, which is uh, not necessarily just value. It can be scale contrast, size, textured contrast, color contrast, value contrast, saturation contrast, etc. Uh, again, just using that despair green uh, tinting at the bottom to create a atmospheric sense and, and using the uh, moist brush to just soften the transition a little bit. Um, it's a feathering sort of technique which I'll talk more about in a, a later video at some point. I just hair dryer there. Oh, little, little shot of the, the workhorse, the hair dryer. Magnificent. Uh, so, very ordinary camera work there, but uh, I'm just going in and using the dilute glazes again to soften the transitions and uh, make sure I've got all of my lights uh, in the right place on the shoulder pad. And uh, make a few tweaks to the actual light placements at this point just to working a little bit better with the surface. Honestly, the, the these breastplates aren't, or sorry, shoulder pads aren't the best uh, version, I think, of non-metallic metal that I've done, but um, for the purposes of the demonstration of the video, they're pretty good. Um, once again, ice yellow, that highlight, a uh, little bit more uh, precise with the placements of this than, than the previous one, a little bit more of the magic mix mixed in to dilute it. Uh, and I'll continue to work with uh, that, there's that uh, despair green glazing, just to add the subtle elements similar to the rest of the model. Um, <clears throat> the black lining very important stage as we saw before and you'll see the difference it makes on this particular section is pretty stark how how much of a difference it makes towards making it look like metallic surface and then again that uh, that final pure ivory touches also has a pretty big impact so uh, this is more repetition so I will uh, go dark for a bit Uh, so, as I uh, progress uh, uh, more and more into the uh, nuance uh, of the model, I decided to add another um, more uh, overt color to this um, this aquatic feel, which is a Vallejo model color called Blue Green, and uh, I'm adding that uh, mostly from the the bottom uh, and uh, and using it quite a quite a lot it is still that glaze type color uh, with the jose on your mix to really um, make sure that it's blending in a little bit easier
Very good. So that's that's the non-metallic technique uh, in a nutshell, I guess. Um, there's there's many many different approaches to to doing it. Um, this is my way. It's certainly probably not correct uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, it is fun. Does create a really interesting effect, and uh, you know I think uh, as with any element of painting, the the uh, time that you invest in um, developing any specific section will, will determine the, the end result. Uh, you can invest a lot of time in, in refining and creating a uh, perfect non-metallic metal, um, and you can do that using this uh, this technique as, as your starting point, um, or you can uh, you can do this sort of effect, which is uh, you know relatively quick, but but um, sells it quite well. Uh, so I'm doing the final uh, sort of micro detailing here with pure ivory, little thin scratches and uh, and so on. Um, you can probably see uh, that I don't often put my brush in the wrong spot, uh, and that's you know, one of the reasons I talk regularly about practicing. Um, you know, brush brush skills are are a skill that uh, like any other dexterity related skill or it's important that you continually uh, practice and uh, and give those as much of a, um, a workout as you can so that you can increase your speed um, if you tried to do this technique as I've just demonstrated uh, today it's very unlikely that you'd be able to do it as quickly um, because you don't have that muscle memory so practice 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 is the key um, all right, it's uh, bringing this video to a close. So this is the second of third part, uh, three parts. Uh, the colors that I've used in each of the videos are uh, put at the end. You'll see a little photo of all the colors that have been used. Um, if you have any questions about uh, the techniques or feedback about the videos, feel free to catch me on the socials. Uh, and that's it. Very good. See ya.